Okay, so let's go ahead and cover this. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not trying to put the family on blast. So I'm not trying to refer to them as their name. I'm just going to call them the family. If you want to find their TikToks, you can. I just think they're getting mercilessly bullied right now on the internet. But more than that, I think the conversation we should have here is not only one with compassion, but also one that's more realistic about what I would do if I was them or what we would do if we were them or rather what we would do to even avoid the situation in the first place. So keep that in mind as we watch. Here is the original TikTok that has 10 million views. The text on the screen reads, when you have a one bedroom with six people, a bedroom becomes more essential than a dining room. That's the text on the screen here. Here we go. As you can read in the caption above, we're a family of six going on seven, living in a one bedroom apartment. As the kids grow older, that means we constantly have to adapt our environment to give them more means for privacy and extra space. When outside our environment appears cluttered, disorganized, what have you. But quite frankly, after making do for nearly three years now, I have nothing but a grateful spirit for the roof over our head. Generally, the instant judgment me and my husband receive, why have so many kids if you don't have enough space for them? See, my perception is judgment comes from a place of not having the experience. When you've experienced enough, you generally don't judge people. I can tell you after everything I've been through in the past three years, there's very little I have to judge people. I would be lying if I said there wasn't a point in my life that I was so naive that I might have judged a poor person based off their appearance. And like I said, I have learned a lot. I generally look like I'm roughing it, but that's because our kids come first. I do everything I can to keep our environment clean and tidy. When it comes down to it, I could shove everything my kids have in one bedroom of some of these houses I see, and it would really look like nothing. We try to teach our kids to take care of what they have, be grateful for what we have, and keep praying and pushing for the growth that we want. Appreciate y'all watching. See you in the next video. So you can see that the image she shows, there is a bed for one of the smaller children there is a it looks like a futon but i can't tell if it's just blankets stacked up on each other some people i i didn't trust people's comments like there's a lot of comments and videos and stitches but i felt like we were all seeing different things when we were watching the video so i'm like really confused about exactly what this is is it a futon is it a bunch of covers is it a mattress some people are saying the kids don't have a mattress but i obviously see a kid's bed here and i see a thick, it looks pretty thick, what the baby is laying on, but I'm not sure. And then, of course, it's the idea that they live in a one bedroom. The parents have the master bedroom or the primary bedroom, and the children sleep in the living room. I think what's kind of interesting is, well, a lot of decisions were made here. What do you guys think initially? What are some of the things that you notice? Because uh, right away, I started to notice a few things that I thought were interesting. And just for context, because I think this is important, we all grew up in very different worlds with very different expectations of what the basic needs of a child is. So, you know, I grew up in two places. I grew up in Orange County, California, and then I grew up more in Southern California in Riverside County. When I grew up in Orange County, California, we had a much bigger home, 3,000 square feet, five bedroom. It was a normal kind of lower middle class home in California at the time. That was what it was. And then we moved to a nicer neighborhood, but a smaller home in my teens when I was about 15. So we went from having 10 kids with five bedrooms to eight kids with three bedrooms. And we put the boys and the girls in separate rooms, my sister and I, and then six of my brothers in one room. My two older brothers had gone off to the military. And when my parents moved into this like 1500 square foot house, it was built in the seventies. It's super cute now, five acres, very cute house. A lot of people were like, I can't believe you have six boys in one bedroom. But to be fair, one, we all grew up together, we're all friends, and two, there was three bunk beds in the room. So each boy had their own bed. And if you come from homeschooling bubbles, lots of homeschoolers share bedrooms. Lots of siblings share bedrooms, even if you're not homeschooled. It's not very uncommon to share a bedroom, and I think it's kind of interesting that people don't realize this. Like, I don't know what you think happens when people have more than like three kids, but people share a bedroom. That's what you do. So I didn't mind it. I always loved sharing a bedroom with my sister. I think she probably less liked sharing a bedroom with me since I was messier than her. And then my brothers, I'm sure, would have preferred some privacy at times. But, you know, ultimately, we all stayed up giggling with each other and telling each other stories and talking about anime for most of our life. And so we kind of liked it. Like, I think we liked it for the most part. I'll speak for myself. I didn't mind sharing a bedroom. But I will tell you, in Orange County, California, when we lived there, there was an era of my life where I did have my own bedroom and my sister had her own bedroom and we put the boys upstairs in a two bedroom so they could have like the whole upstairs to themselves after my two older brothers moved out. And that was really cool. And my whole bedroom from like, like 
literally tip to top to top to bottom was filled with anime posters. And I remember, ah, yes, this was the height of independence. And I had my own computer in my room. Very big deal. Very cutesy, very demure. And that was like the, I just remember that being like a very cool experience. But also after that, because I was younger at the time, maybe 13, 14, I don't remember. When I was 15, 16, 17, I ended up sharing a bedroom with my sister. And we also didn't mind that. We went back and forth. Like I said, I had my only, I had my own room for just like a little bit and that was cool, but not the worst thing in the world. So when we come from different perspectives, some people will see that and say like, oh, that's sad. You didn't have your own room. And then some people are like, oh, that's so cool. I wish I had siblings to share a bedroom with. It's all about perspective. Now I want to go to the chat before we move on to talk about their situation, which I think is a little bit different. Uh, Let me see. Chat says, my thing is, why are the parents utilizing the master bed for only themselves, but not giving the children the bedroom? I feel like if I was a parent, I'd pull, I'd get a pull out couch and sleep there and and give the eldest kids the master. I thought CPS required bedrooms for each gender shared with, uh, was fine among sisters and brothers. I know CPS does have very big rules about same gender children in rooms and they want kids to like have separate rooms. But I I really want to make it clear that I don't think this family needs, I don't think CPS needs to be called on this family. I'm not seeing anything in their videos. I haven't watched very many of them, but CPS needs to be called in very rare circumstances. And I don't, I'm not seeing that this is exactly one of those circumstances, but I will say that I'm not sure that the parents have the greatest character based off of what I've seen of some of their videos. I'm not sure that they are responsible parents, but I'm not sure that they're abusive parents. And I think these are two very different things. Now, I will say abuse and neglect go hand in hand. We talked about this the other day. I do think there's parts of them that are very neglectful, which I would argue is abusive, but not to the point of calling CPS. Given that CPS statistics, your children going into the system, it is far worse from them than ending up with parents who are slightly neglectful. And so CPS is like a very big conversation to have around this. Now, one of the conversations that is happening around TikTok and even was mentioned on stream yesterday is the conversation around eugenics and whether or not poor people should have babies. I just want to make it abundantly clear. I never like, first of all, I, my brain never goes there, but I already saw too many TikToks talking about it. I want to make it abundantly clear. The government is never, and should never be allowed to tell you who like tell you, you can have a baby. I don't think the government should be, should ever be able to come in and tell you you're poor, you can't have a baby, you're disabled, you can't have a baby, you're black, you can't have a baby, you're gay, you can't have a baby, you're borderline, you can't have a baby. Like, I want to make it abundantly clear the government should never tell you whether or not you should force, be forced to keep a pregnancy or whether you should terminate a pregnancy or whether, like, I never want the government involved in my body. I just want to make it abundantly clear from my perspective. So we are never having a government intervention conversation. We are never having a conversation of, you know, parents should have licenses to to be, to have children or people should have to go to classes to be parents. Like I'm not interested in any of that. I am not interested in having conversations that are about the government getting involved on whether or not you should be like tested before you become a parent. Like I'm not interested in that conversation, right? I don't think that's the government's business. Now, separate from that, from an ethical or moral perspective, I think there's a conversation to be had about being responsible and having these children. And I think that is where a lot of people are coming from. Is it irresponsible to keep making babies in a situation in which you cannot provide financially for them enough to have a larger, more reasonable space for them? Because I assume if you can't afford a bigger apartment, there's also other things you're not affording. And I think that's the question. Now, you guys know that I've chosen to be child-free. My partner and I do not personally live up to the standard we expect of parents. And so we refuse to continue to have children without breaking those generational curses. There are many reasons we chose not to have children, uh, including we just don't want to be parents. But mostly we sat down and asked ourselves, are we willing and can we reach that standard of parenting we would prefer the bare minimum before becoming parents? And we don't think we can do that. One, I'm disabled. Two, we have enough health problems between the two of us. And three, we just don't have the income. Like realistically, uh, for a big part of us is like our health and our income. And I think that that's a big deal for us. Now, for many people, I make more than like minimum wage. I make more than maybe an average person to some extent, not much more, but somewhat more. And some people would say, well, you make more than other people and other people are having four kids. 
yeah, I think those people aren't great parents. Not that they're bad parents, but I think that those people are making decisions based off of some biological urge or societal expectation of them that isn't rooted necessarily in being the best parent. You know how people always say there's never a good time to be a parent, but there are bad times. There are bad times. You know, yes, you'll never be a perfect parent, even great parents, but there definitely are worse times to become a parent. And probably one of them is a partner and partners who aren't working on making their income more, who aren't focused on working, and who are focused on just making babies. Apparently, according to a lot of the TikToks around the story, the father works part-time and refuses to spend much more of his time working because he wants to live life and play games with his kids, which we've seen in some of the families. We um, watched a documentary about, I don't know, two, three months ago about a family that basically does its best to live off disability so they don't have to work and so they can spend time with their kids. Sounds kind of nice, but also does that fit the standard of parenting that we want for the world? Now, of course, we can live in ideal hypotheticals about the government giving us like a basic income so we can stay home with our kids and that's like a conversation for another day. I think what we really want to say is what what could have been some of the decisions we could have made to sort of prevent this lifestyle, but also how do we feel about the fact you know, that this family, in my opinion, seems to be exploiting their children in order to be kind of popular. Allegedly, they've been trying to do this for a couple of years. And a part of me feels like there were so many other avenues you could have taken before making this the decision. Example, let me bring this up for you guys. Hold on. I saved some TikToks to show you because I know a lot of people and I really do, they get so down on themselves for being bad parents or not good enough. But I just wanna say like, you are good enough, okay? Even the best parents aren't perfect parents. It's not that you're not good enough. It's just that I'm not sure what your intentions are with your parenting, you know? So here is an example of like a really cute little TikTok that I saw. It says, looking back at my first one bedroom, 500 square foot apartment that I shared with my two-year-old. It, <laughs> it says, I lived in a constant state of she deserves more. She deserves better than this. I, I know, I see. It says, I decorated my closet into her own little bedroom. She won't remember how much money we had, but she will remember her mom did her best. And I think that's really cute. Like, that's a really good example of someone doing their absolute best to create a really good environment for their kids. In comparison, I'm not sure this is the same thing, but I will say this. I do think this is the best these people can do. I think all parents in all situations, all people in all situations are doing the best they can do. And I think that's hard for us to accept. I think we want to believe that people could be doing more, but everybody could be. Why aren't you doing more? Tell me right now, why aren't you doing more? Because you can't. You're tired. Your finances are strained. You're already working two jobs. You just can't right now. But if you could, I think you would. I do. I think people are really doing their best. I think people are doing exactly what they can do. I think every time we get it into our heads that people are just lazy, I think people are lost. I don't think people know what to do. I don't think people are educated enough or have these, it's like the same reason you don't have kids just because you make enough money. Like rich people have kids all the time when they shouldn't be. It's not just about the money. It's about understanding the job of parenting, right? And so again, when we're having these conversations, we have to understand like people are doing what they think is best. Chet says, is part-time the best he can do though? It's the best he can do. It's the best he can do. Not the best you can do and not the best I can do. The best he can do. Now, doing your best isn't enough. That doesn't mean it's enough. Doing your best is enough, but it's never enough. Because, it, it, well, in this situation, it wouldn't be enough. And that's the question. If when I'm doing my best, I still can't do this thing, maybe I shouldn't do the X, Y, Z, right? And that's, that's the dilemma. That's the disconnect. 
is just because it's your best. Look, I meet people all the time who are disabled who want to have children. And I think that's a very interesting decision to make. But at the same time, like if you can do it, you can do it. Not all people who are disabled aren't going to be good parents because they're disabled. If you can do it, do it. But I think it's interesting when people make decisions to produce children that are like 50% likely to get the illness that caused their life to be such a struggle. And that sounds like eugenics, but I want to make it very clear. I do not want the government ever telling you what to do. I'm asking you from a moral perspective, how do you feel about this? This thing that burdened you your whole life, this thing that made your life so difficult, why are you passing it along to your child? Now you can do that. Actually, there were some YouTubers. I don't, I'm really trying hard to like not name names necessarily, but I was always shocked when I would see YouTubers who had like really difficult illnesses where their children are 50% likely get it, where they had to get surgeries and ask their audience for donors, you know, for their own parents. And then they went and made children who would also be 50% at risk of needing a transplant. I'm like, why are we doing that? And we're doing it because we think it's the best. We're doing it because people are biological creatures and their biological experience is encouraging them to create offspring, right? And I acknowledge that my biological experience doesn't have this. I've never had the urge to necessarily pass along my genes. I've only ever had the urge to be a mother. I've never had the urge to like be like have genetic children, right? Like that, I want to make it very clear that I am never talking about governments telling you you shouldn't have a baby. I'm asking you, why did you have a baby? What was your thought process? What was the thing you were looking forward to? What was your what was your thought process knowing you make 25K a year? Why were you why are you having four kids? Like what what's that about? In the same way that I would ask you, why are you buying a sixty thousand dollar car if you make twenty five K a year? What was that about? Like what what made that decision reasonable to you? You know, what was your thought process? You only live once. YOLO, like, what was it? So with compassion and love, it's like, okay, why did you make that decision? Because I think that's really where the answer lies, right? Chat says my sister and her husband wouldn't have children until they made a combined 170,000 a year. That's what it requires to raise a child middle class in America. Oh, I just re-looked up the expectations of what is lower middle class or middle class. And unless you're making well above six figures, you're not middle class. And that's, I think we're not paying attention to how this is impacting families because people are justifying. They're saying, well, I make 50K and I have five kids. Yeah, maybe that was not what we all want. Maybe we don't want that life. It feels like uh, Miranda from Devil Wears Prada where she's like, oh, shut up. Everybody wants this. No, no, we don't. We do not want this. And so for people to be sitting here and saying like, I can't believe you can't have kids on 150,000. I do it on 50K. You don't do it on 50K. You barely do it on 50K. You are struggling. And we don't need to be struggling. Like, and I feel like sometimes people resent people who make the decision not to struggle because we're doing it on behalf of the children, of course, but also on, on the quality of life we're having. Now, if you believe you're obligated to have children, if you believe you're obligated to procreate, then we're having different conversations. Even, you know, prior to getting sick and when I was thinking about becoming a mother and adopting as a single parent, I was like, how much money do I have to make? And I was like, I need to make like $200,000 because I'm a single parent who's probably going to adopt a disabled kid who's going to need a lot of resources. And I was like, I'm not doing it unless I make that much money. I'm not doing it unless I have a house. I'm not doing it unless I have this because even adopting a child, right? out of that situation and into a better one would still require me to have a standard for that child. And I think that's what people forget is like, you can dream about becoming a parent because you think it will be fun, but it's less fun when your kid has that, that medical debt. It's less fun when your kid has a lot of problems. It's less fun when your kid didn't ask to be here. And so again, when we're having these conversations, I know why people get into these situations. So I don't even have to judge them really. I just have to say, okay, how do I pay attention to who they are in the story and how do I avoid being that person? How do I avoid being this person? Because I think this is who you should avoid being. And I think that's how we should look at it. Instead of condemning these people as bad people, we should just say, okay, I don't want to be this person. And then make sure you're not this person. Like make sure you do not want to be this. Like if you don't want to be this person, don't be this person. People make decisions every day to procreate. I see it all the time. Remember that guy we watched who lived with his parents and couldn't even figure out how to live outside of his parents' home and he had a kid? People do it all the time. People do it all the time, okay? Now, 
There are some other TikToks that had some pretty strong opinions about this situation. I thought maybe we could hear from them just to get a little bit of a, a different perspective. I don't think your classes or you hate poor people. Just okay, let's see. So obviously there was conversations about whether or not you're classist or hate poor people because you don't think they should have kids. I just want to make it very clear. I don't think most people should have kids. I Not that I think the government should come in and say anything about it, but I don't think most people are prepared to break generational curses before having children. Now, I'm not, that's not to say you're a bad person for having kids. Like, I think this is very nuanced and it's hard for people to hear me because they get very offended. And also you're having a biological experience that's telling you to make babies versus I don't have that. So you have to understand from my brain perspective, I don't have this thing that's like must make babies. I'm like, no, that's like saying you have a biological experience or biological experience or perspective that's telling you like must buy Ferrari. I don't have that. Like, I don't I don't have it. So from my perspective, it's it's probably easier for me to say, like, don't have babies versus people who are who are like, I have to have babies. I have to have babies. Yeah, because you're not like. You're having this particular biological experience with procreation, right? Okay, so here's someone replying to that family and their thoughts on it. I don't think your classes or you hate poor people just for saying, hey, y'all had enough people living in that one bedroom. You didn't need to create another. And this is coming from someone who lived in a situation with five people in a one bedroom. My mom got the room. Me and my three siblings would sleep on a pullout couch in the living room. So when I saw the initial video that went viral, I wasn't coming from a place of judgment i really wanted to know man how did they find themselves in this situation so i scroll all the way down to 2022 when she first started doing co content and when she met this man she had two children he had one child so they're instant family of five and they were living in that same one bedroom apartment okay those three babies were sleeping in the living room and guess what her and her man actively trying to have another baby i think that's the part that throws people off it wasn't an it wasn't a oopsie it wasn't an accident no they plan to have this baby and nine times out of ten the one that she's pregnant with now they plan for that one as well but they didn't plan to upgrade their space that's the part that's frustrating I agree. I think that is the part that is frustrating to a lot of people. I mean, we're really out here trying to be responsible, trying to make it in this capitalistic hellscape, and you're just out here making babies. And now, don't get me wrong, I think understanding contraceptives and having a relationship with birth control and knowing what doctors to go to, that's really difficult. But you know what's cheaper than having a baby? Birth control. Like an IUD is like a set fee of less than $2,000, and it's good for five to seven years. You know what I mean? Like even the, the, I have the next on in my arm and it's good for two to five years. And it was like, I think I paid $1,200 for it in cash. So, you know, you know, what's cheaper than a baby birth control. So don't even tell me like, oh, birth control is expensive. Not if you get the IUD and not if you get the next on, which are basically the safer options anyways, for a lot of people, not everybody, but for a lot of people. That's the part that I can't get behind. And I'm actually happy for her that she was able to kind of get this following and hopefully she seizes this opportunity and makes something of it and makes the best of it and is able to change their financial situation. But I don't know if changing the financial situation is really going to change the living situation because I've also seen a video where she said their dream is to own a tiny home and it's like, babe, she got an <laughs> extra large family. Y'all can't fit in no tiny home. Exactly. That remember how I say people cope with the tiny home dream because they want a cheaper living. It is very inconvenient to live in a tiny home, especially with a family of five, seven, seven total, two parents, five kids. That is a very inconvenient living. And they're trying to like, they're not being resourceful. They're being, they're being, they're, they're not being like resourceful and being, you know, good with finances. They're using it as like an escape to be responsible enough to afford a life. And this is the dilemma. I love a tiny home life. I love a trailer life. I love a small like farm life, but people who do it because they're escaping responsibility are not going to have a good time of it. They're not going to have a good time of it. Right. Chat says I got the copper IUD. Fun fact, I'm allergic to copper and I got the copper IUD and it was the worst time of my life because I didn't realize I was actually like, I knew I was allergic my whole life to copper earrings, but I didn't think about it. We did the copper IUD and it almost put me in the hospital. So fun fact, if you're allergic to copper, obviously don't get the copper IUD. I got the Marina and I really loved it. Not right now, at least not right now. So I really do hope the best for her and her family. 
and I've seen people say, well, at least they got a roof over their head. And I really do understand that. But the quality of the roof matters as well. Oof, amen. Again, this is coming from someone who's been in a situation like that. We've shared. <sighs> like you want to talk about breaking generational curses? Poverty. You want to talk about breaking generational curses? Time. One thing I will say, my parents really wanted to be parents and they were open to life, right? They didn't believe in birth control um, when they were more Catholic. There was a time in their life when they were less Catholic and did birth control. And then later they became more Catholic and stopped using birth control. They had 10 kids. They really wanted to be parents. But I will tell you this, no matter how much they wanted to be a parent, they were also just two people and there was not enough time for each child. And so children were neglected. Not in a way that would be obvious, but in a way that's like obvious at the same time, because you literally do not have enough hours in the day. So you want to talk about breaking generational curses, realizing how much time do you have for a child, which is also one of the things that went into our decision not to have a child is, okay, how much time do we have throughout the day and how much time can we allocate to a child and how do we feel about that? And, you know, I think a lot of people forget that especially if you don't have a village, especially if you don't have a community, especially if you don't have help, people forget, like you have to think about the time. Homes with my aunts and cousins. I literally slept on a couch all the way up to college. I didn't get my own room until college. And I'm not saying that she needs to have a four or five, six bedroom home right, right. to have her big family, but two or three bedrooms could help. I don't think your class. I, I love this video. I agree. I am not saying she needs to have a mansion, but like having a couple more bedrooms would be very helpful. Now, if her husband would work more, that would probably help if she got up maybe a babysitting job or something or just helped with the kids at home. If they, you know, there's so many things that could go into helping your life be a little bit better. But OK, so that's one person's comment. Check out another's. So she said we shouldn't be judging her because we don't have the experience. Well, baby, I grew up like this, so I have the experience. I'm and I understand a lot of people's trauma is going to come out. And that's why they're also upset because they were those children and it was hard. But more than that, it's coming from people. It's coming from two groups of people, people who have never lived like that. And they're judging and people who have had to live like that. And they're like, this is the generational curse I'd love to stop for my kids. So it's interesting. Chat said it too. Like, it's hard to imagine being a parent who's been through that. And then you do it to your kids. But that's what a generational curse is. It's your parents repeating patterns that they suffered from their parents. And then you repeat the pattern you suffered from your parent. So you have to be the kid that breaks that generational curse, which is really fucking hard because then you have to say out loud, my parents weren't perfect. You know, you have to make, you have to actually say out loud, my parents could have done better, even though they couldn't have done better because they did their best that I'm going to be the one to break that generational curse. And that's why cycles repeat because it's very hard. And then what if your family doesn't talk to you because they think, oh, you think you're better than me? Like, oh, you think you're better than me that you're not going to have kids when I had kids. And it becomes this whole pressure and society says, but have babies, have babies. There are politicians right now saying that women are JD Vance is basically saying like, being single and without children is worse than having children basically in poverty because it's really the argument he's making coming from the child's perspective they are not all right and i just saw another creator who said the kids are okay they don't even know they're poor because they don't know they're poor unless somebody tell them baby i knew i was poor by the age of four nobody had to tell me i was poor i had eyes i could see I knew what the other kids had. And then when I, especially when I got into school, I knew I was poor. Because kids are in a loving home does not mean that they're okay. Because a loving home would make sure the kids had their own space. A loving home would make sure the kids had a mattress to sleep on at minimum. A loving home would not have children sleeping by a front door where if somebody broke in immediately, they're the first people. I think that's the part that's kind of shocking is the kids. Okay, so the kids have the living room and kitchen. That means they are the first people the intruder sees if they come through the front door. It means the kids could have possibilities of running into the stove, right? They could get into stuff in the kitchen. It's not probably baby proofed in a way that would be reasonable. A lot of some people don't believe in baby proofing. I believe in baby proofing. I think there's a way to baby proof your home within reason. And I think one of them is keeping the kids maybe not near the kitchen at night when you're sleeping. And so, you know, there's much that goes into that, right? who are going to be in danger and then you know kids they're bad they don't listen those kids can leave the house they won't know because they're back there hunching playing the ps5 watching tv that's not a loving home i've seen a lot of creators on here 
Now, I will say I won't black and white say that's not a loving home, but I would black and white say um, this is a systematic issue. This is an education issue. And this is probably how their parents raise them issue. Right. I'm not sure that it's not a loving home, but I'm pretty sure it's not necessarily the it's definitely not what we want. I think I saw a TikTok that said it best. If you think about your childhood, would you want your child to live through it? Would you want your child to have the same childhood you had? And I would say, obviously not fully, right? Like some parts, sure, but a lot of the parts, no. And that's really hard for people to admit out loud. Like, oh, I wouldn't want my child, like I wouldn't raise my child the way that I was raised necessarily. And that's a very important realization. Now, these people might say, yes. These people might say, I love my kids. I grew up fine. I think kids growing up this way is fine. But you know. Come on here, show how they have their one bedroom set up with multiple kids. It's a lady in New York. She's a single mom. I love her content. Her one bedroom with her two kids is amazing. Okay. It looks amazing and it's clean. It's other creators who has one bedroom with multiple kids. And guess what? The kids are in the bedroom. Yeah, I think it's important. Oh, that was the end, I guess. Right. So she said, yeah, I think what's important here is that the children being able to function in the bedroom would just be more efficient as well. Personally, I think if you put a couple of bunk beds in the room and made the room really cool with beds around the walls and like a safety exit and then like the toys would be organized too. I actually think a lot of it is like cleanliness for sure. Toys, sometimes an abundance of toys are actually like a negative for the children. You want to have the right amount of toys. You want to have the right amount of things for them to do. So I would think that it'd be more efficient. And I feel like the parents would have much more privacy in the living room. Once the kids go to bed, they can cook together, watch TV together, make love together. I just feel like there's so much more. I, as a parent, I would want so much more mobility in the kitchen than I would in the bedroom. Like what, what purpose would it be to, for me to be in the bedroom and my kids to be out in the living room? Like that for me doesn't serve a purpose, right? It just, it doesn't even efficiently make sense. I think I'm very confused by that decision. Okay. Nobody talking about the fact that this family of six, about to be seven, is about to be homeless. The same way that that guy that showed that him and his girlfriend were living in a store shed and the store shed company found out. And they kicked that couple out because you're not supposed to be doing that. The same way you're not supposed to be having six people live in a one bedroom apartment. First of all, it's a safety hazard. It violates the fire code, making that whole apartment complex uninsurable. It's interesting because there are some apartments that will limit the amount of people in an apartment, including children. I don't know if this apartment building is actually one of those, but that is the case in some places. So now the manager has to get involved, even if they didn't want. To. And also the Department of Children and Family have to get involved because you now. Hold on. Chad says the reason the parents might want a primary bedroom is for intimacy. But it'd be more you'd have just as much intimacy in the living room. Because the kids are all young. You would put the kids to bed at night and then you would have the whole living room, the kitchen to do whatever you wanted. Like, what's the difference? If the kids can come into your bedroom, they can come into the living room. There's no difference between the parents having the bedroom and the kids having the kitchen. Right? Like, I don't, I don't know that there's a difference. So maybe they think there's a difference, but there's literally not a difference. There's still a door between the two. So kind of interesting broadcast that you have unsafe living conditions because that many people are not hold up hold up they're talking about sex you can lock the door versus not lock the door you can lock the door y'all what do you mean you can lock a bedroom door from the outside or inside you just switch the doorknob like you know what i'm saying Chad says, not every parent puts their kids to bed at the set time. Well, that's probably bad parenting. I knew kids that would be up till midnight and go to bed when the parents did. Yeah, I think that's bad parenting. I think every pediatrician, every book on parenting I've ever read is like, your kids need to go to bed. You need to go to bed. Do you know sleep is absolutely impacting your longevity, dementia, Alzheimer's? Like, you need to sleep. Children need to sleep. Now, again, this is the conversation that I would be able to have with my partner because I've read a bunch of books. I know these things. And that's also why we've chosen not to be parents because, you know, we struggle to get our sleep and we know how important it is. We would never sleep if we had a child. If we had a baby, 
in the middle of the night who always need to be breastfed, like I'm not sleeping and I'm already not sleeping enough with my fibromyalgia. So you're right that these parents aren't thinking about those things, but this is why we're having that conversation to say, we don't want to be this parent in the story. Like if you're growing up and you're like, their life is what I want, go to therapy and recontextualize this like life. Like really think about that sort of relationship that you are having with yourself and these kids and everything else, right? So, you know, in my opinion, these are good examples to learn from, but you're right. They're not thinking, well, obviously if they're still having children in a one bedroom, they're not thinking about anything. They're not thinking about condoms. They're not thinking about pulling out. They're not thinking about those children. They're not thinking about their finances. If he's only working part-time and refuses to work more, like, of course, you know what I mean? Of course they're not. Like, of course, like, of course, they're not thinking about these things. So I agree with you in that. Right. Chat says locking your kids in a room is considered child abuse. No, it is not. It is literally like child safety in a lot of but it could be abuse. It could be used for abusive reasons. Right. You, it could be used for abusive reasons, but it also could be like a safety measure to make sure that the children aren't, you know, because I I had a I had a baby in the family that would like leave their bedroom and run around the living room at night because they just couldn't sleep. And it's like, yeah, like you want to make sure you, if you're asleep, your kid isn't running around and getting into the knives or getting into the electric sockets or getting into something else. But you also want to make sure you don't lock the door to such a point where you can't get into the room because if there's a fire that breaks out, like it's really scary, obviously. So obviously I don't know if locking the, like you don't want to torture your children, but you also don't want to neglect your children. So I feel like the context is important, but I hear you not supposed to live in a one bedroom so now you're at risk to be homeless and possibly have your kids taken away all because you want an internet clout no nope. i think they're hoping to use the internet clout for money possibilities or access to resources and i think that's probably what's happening more or less okay that is what i wanted to show you in regards to tiktoks so again when we're having these conversations i know it's difficult Chat says, I found if you don't have kids, don't even try to talk about good versus bad parenting with parents. It has never gone well. I think even if you have kids, it's hard, right? So I will say this. Obviously, it's difficult to hear that you weren't a perfect parent. It's hard for my own parents to hear that. It's hard for anyone to hear that you weren't perfect and that you and your children felt even slightly abused, right? We hear this a lot in conservative bubbles. What do you mean you were abused? I fed you. I clothed you. I gave you a bed. You also beat me. You know, you also like punished us. You also broke all of my CDs. You also were homophobic and transphobic. You were also like all of these other things. Like a lot of people, a lot of children in order to break this generational curse, we have got to be the uncomfortable people to have those conversations. I love you. I love the spirit that you are. But as a parent, you failed at this, this, and this, as we all will fail at multiple things in our life. So as hurtful it is, as it is for parents to hear any criticism about their parenting, imagine being your child. Imagine being the child of that parent who has to subdue their own feelings because they don't want to hurt the feelings of the adult in the room that was supposed to be responsible for them. Because that's what this conversation ultimately is. It's the adults in the room that had the audacity to make the kid in the first place, not being able to handle how your child saw you or looked at you. Children are judging you. I remember the first like thought of when I started to look at adults and judge them, right? And I look at my nieces and nephews now and I assume they are judging the f out of us. I am assuming they are taking note to share with their therapists in the future of all the times Auntie Brittany wasn't perfect or all the times their parents weren't perfect. And I don't blame them because they're right. We're not perfect. I've made mistakes as an aunt already. I have already made mistakes as an aunt. And I'm like, that's gonna show up in therapy. <laughs> and that sucks. Because I would love to think of myself as like this person who really knows better, but I'm just a human like the rest of us. So I'm not coming from a place of saying you have to be perfect. I'm coming from a place of saying, how do we break these generational curses? How do we do it? How do we have conversations that even if it hurts your feelings, we're willing to acknowledge the pain people have suffered? And you know what sucks? It really sucks that in so many ways, a total stranger on the internet, Dr. Kirkonda, who I've only talked to once was kind enough to leave me a comment on my video today saying, I'm so sorry your parents abused you. You deserved better. Like, oh my gosh, like you're not even my parent. And I come from an immigrant background. So you can imagine the apologies you get from your parents are never as blunt. They're usually something like, I'm sorry you feel that way. I see, I know we weren't perfect, Betsy, but we tried. 
And I get it. That's their journey. I can accept that as like the intent it is. For another person to acknowledge it, it's such a powerful thing. Like it's a very powerful feeling to have people acknowledge instead of, oh, it was the liberal media. Oh, you just went away from Jesus. Oh, you just, it's like, now you have to do the emotional labor for your parents, which I have very strong boundaries about, right? I'm open with boundaries. Do people just keep having kids thinking things will just work out? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, they do. That's exactly what happens. They have kids thinking it will just work out. Chat says, interesting to think about the tendency of large families and small spaces historically and how governments worldwide often try to block access to birth control while the economy gets more inequitable. Bro, don't even get me started. Discord says, I shared a room with my two sisters. I didn't mind too much. It really helps uh, with bonding. True. And it's great for learning how to share a space with someone. I know people who grew up like this family, they're definitely not okay, but they function in society for the most part, which is also true. The truth is, People will basically be able to function in the world, mostly. And that's kind of interesting. I think that is what I find personally fascinating is even though these children are growing up in a not ideal situation, they'll probably be okay-ish. Maybe not perfect and maybe not to the standard of what you would love or maybe even the standard of what they would love, but they'd be okay-ish. I remember I had a caller years and years ago, really cool girl doing a lot of volunteer work, worked in, worked in social services. And she grew up in like um, government housing. I don't, I think it was section eight, but she grew up like in like very poverty, poverty, poverty. And her, her mother, her brothers, all of them we thought were kind of like ones almost where like they were so incapable of introspecting to any degree to move slightly even outside of that perspective, which is a journey that they were going on. But for some reason, not her, for some reason, she was able to get educated, get a job, do a bunch of things. She was educated enough to sort of even come here and and find my channel and have a conversation with me and all of these things. And she was so cool. She was like, oh my gosh, you really are the like the generational curse breaker. Like she was the the child who like looked around her and popped all the bubbles and said like, I think I'm going to do something different. And I was like, oh my God. And there's guilt associated with that. Her, her family, I can't believe you're doing this to us. I can't believe you're leaving us. I can't believe you're not going to, because again, when you're that child, you're also the breadwinner. You also become, and maybe not in her case particularly, but you do become sort of the child who can now provide for the people that can't provide for themselves, but not in like a cute, humble way, in a take advantage of the child way. And it's very difficult to say, I'm open with boundaries. I love you, but I'm not funding this family. And that's really, really hard. So imagine being those kids who have to pull apart from their family. So now you're putting your kid in a double, double whammy bind. And you know what? For all the shit Dave Ramsey gets, he always tells parents, do not burden your kids with having to take care of you. To the best of your ability, it's so unkind to raise children and then say, now I expect you to raise me. And he's just like, no, like you should be able to fund yourself, but also if you've done your best and you get sick and your kids take care of you, that's just love. Your kids taking care of you because you prepared is love. Your kids burdening themselves with, oh my God, my parents, oh my God, my parents, what am I going to do about my parents? I can't, I can't even feed myself and now I have to fund my parents. That's not love. That's stress, unnecessary stress. And it's going to be a lot of people in the world. Okay. It's going to be a lot of people in the world. Okay. And I think there's something to that. Like, I really appreciate that my parents are financially responsible enough to like pay off their home and to make enough money. And if they ever needed help in the future, of course, we'd be willing to help them because, you know, they were just responsible. They figured it out. They weren't perfect all of their life. I mean, they had a lot of kids at 30 and then all the way to 65, you know, now they're 65, but their last kid was at 40. But I think it's like really amazing. Um that they did their best. And now, of course, if they need help, it just feels like, of course, of course, I'll help you. Like you're not taking advantage of your kids. So of course I'm, I'm going to help you. But if you, if I ever felt like you were taking advantage of me, you're getting cut out. To break a generational curse is very difficult because man, there were so many parts of my childhood I would have loved to have recreated for a kid. There, there are so many memories I have that I would have loved to have recreated for a child. And then there were parts of it that I would never. And you know, my partner and I talked about this a lot. Like we would want to raise our kids near a village and neither of us liked the villages we were raised in enough. Both of us were like, man, I don't want to really raise our kid near our families. And that, that says it all. 
Like, I love my family, but mm, I don't really want to do that. And to be fair, my Catholic brother, the one with five kids, they're not raising their kids near their family either. To be fair, a lot of the siblings aren't religious enough, but they're raising their kids in a Catholic community, but not near their siblings. So in the end, we always do this. Whether you're Catholic or secular, you make a decision to raise your kids in the village that makes sense for you. But I do think it takes a village. I think it's very hard to raise your kids in a world completely isolated. And I think, I think people need to understand that before having kids. I knew a girl in Seattle who was sleeping with this guy and they were friends with benefits type thing. They were kind of casually dating and she got pregnant and it was past the abortion allowance. I think she found out at like 26 or 27 weeks. And I think the cutoff is 24. I could be wrong on the, the timeline, but she kind of hoped it would make their relationship better. And it didn't because they were already having problems. And then they broke up and it was one of the most exhausting, like toxic relationships I had witnessed. None of these people were bad, but they were unhealthy. And so they made an unhealthy decision. And now that baby gets to be the product of that unhealthy decision. And that baby gets to grow up with parents who have the story that they have. And that's something, right? So again, with peace and love, I don't mean to take it out on this family. I want to be compassionate and loving, but I also want to say like, this is who I don't want to be in the story. Like, this is who I definitely don't want to be in the story. I don't want to be a person who says my relationship is falling apart. Let's make a baby. I don't want to be the person that says I don't have even $2,000 of savings in my account. Let's make a baby. I don't want to be the person who says, I can't even afford groceries. Let's make a baby. I don't want to be the person in the story who says, I can't even afford an upgrade to my apartment. Let's make a baby. I don't want to be that person in the story. And I'm really lucky that I'm educated enough to get birth control so I don't have to be. And I, I think about it all the time. You know, my mom asked me the other day, how do you know that you're not pregnant? I have a very consistent period and I have, I take pregnancy tests. Even though I have birth control, I take my pregnancy tests because I am terrified of accidentally getting pregnant. I could still technically get pregnant. It'd be very hard, but it's very possible. Okay. We're using every method of birth control possible. We are taking, we're keeping count of all of my like ovulation, my periods, everything is on a calendar. And until I get permanently like my tubes tied or a vasectomy is done until those things are done. I want to be very cautious about the possibility of pregnancy. And then when those things are permanently done, it will be time to like relax. <laughs> I can't wait. I almost, I want to get my tubes tied just so I know I can't get pregnant. It kind of uh, makes me anxious. Even if you got a vasectomy that I'm like, does that mean I could still get pregnant? Obviously not though. It happens if you're not very caught, if you don't get tested after the vasectomy, but it's like, it makes me nervous knowing I could technically still get pregnant. Versus if I just tied my tubes, like I know I can't get pregnant now. I almost want that. I was like, just take it out. Hysterectomy, take it all out. <laughs> you know, not literally, but kind of. I'm like, just get rid of all of it. I just want zero chances. Chat says, why do people think having a baby fixes things? Two, th two reasons. One, people say it. People literally say it. The parents give their children advice and say, my parents gave me the advice the other day. My parents literally gave me the advice the other day that my health would improve if I had a baby because parents tell you it. Your parents will tell you, oh, your life will be more meaningful if you have a baby. Everything will make sense once you have a baby. Have a baby. Hey, you know what a good idea is? Have a baby. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. And they mean it with love, but people really do think having a baby will fix things, even though there's no reason to think that. So there you go. Isn't that interesting? Yes, Chad says, it will make you stronger. Exactly. It will make you stronger. It will give you purpose. It will motivate you to get a job. Well, this dad has like five kids and he still won't get a full-time job. So I guess not. Stop. Uh, Stefan, Katura Stefan says, my mother literally said that the other day. Stop. Exa See? See? It's just a thing people say. So again, you have to recognize if you're the person, and my partner said this to me yesterday. They were like, Brittany, just a reminder that you don't think it's necessary for people to have babies. And I was like, yes. And he goes, so every time you have this conversation, it's going to be confusing to people because people literally think they should have babies. And I was like, yes, but they just have to deconstruct that because I, like, you just have to deconstruct it. And he was like, yes, but you're, you don't care if like humans procreate. I was like, right. And he's like, but people care. And that's true. If you listen to a lot of the streamers, if you listen to a lot of religious people, especially, they'll say you ought to procreate. You ought to have children. You, the human race will go away. There won't be any people on the planet. We have to make babies. And I'm like, 
I don't think it's necessary for humans to exist, but I don't think humans should be systematically murdered. Like I want to make sure we're always talking about freedom of choice. Like if people choose not to have babies and it naturally causes a decline in the population, that's beautiful. If governments come in, if people are forced not to have babies, if people are decided, not okay, not cool, zero chill. Millennial Classics with the super chat, thank you so much, says, do you cover family vlogs? Thoughts? Mm. You know, I try to stay away from family vloggers because I think they're very toxic. I think family vloggers are all suspicious to me. I used to love them back in the day. Oh my God, the way I would watch Shay Carl and his family. And then that whole controversy came out, that cheating son of a bitch. I tried to really love vloggers, but I just started to feel really weird watching people's families, people's kids. I know that content does great on YouTube, but yeah, I don't. I think family vloggers are all very suspicious to me. They're all very questionable. Lady O says, my mother encourages me every day to avoid having children. I love her. She's awesome. That's great. <laughs> She's like canceled. Absolutely not. Chat says, if we agreed on, on no babies, but then I changed my mind, had the convo and he's not budging. I'm 30. Is this divorce territory? I mean, it's really up to you. I think it's difficult to make those decisions. So um, my partner and I had this conversation for a while and ultimately it was, I, I'm going to say it's our decision, but since I'm the one producing the children, a lot of it was on me. And I think that's because obviously I'm the one having the babies, you know, even though we're a great lesbian couple, all, uh, realistically, like I'm the one who'd be birthing that baby. And um, I think when we made this decision and we have made it, going back on that decision would be going back on our sense of character. Not that we can't change our minds, but that it wouldn't make sense with who we are as people. Because when we make a decision as big as this, it has to be a decision based off of values. Like I personally don't wanna be an older parent. So there'd be no reason for me to biologically have a child as an older person and I'm already older, right? I'm 35, my cutoff is like 37 for the last child to be birthed. So we better be pregnant now if we're gonna have a baby, but we're not interested in it. And it would, it's not that it's divorce territory because you changed your mind, but I think it's a testament to someone's character if you know yourself well enough to make that decision because you got to know yourself well enough to make it. And also, is your partner open to adoption? Because my partner and I are open to adoption in the future. We're just closed off to biological children and we probably won't adopt, but it's on the table, you know, but it has to be a team decision. It can't. It's not singular. At the end of the day, it's a team decision. So you have to ask yourself, like, are you on a team? or not. Pat says, I remember you saying you were an antinatalist in your 20s. What made you change your mind? I don't make prescriptions anymore. I don't think people ought to do anything. I think people at most should figure out what their joy is. But being an antinatalist is making a prescription for others that I don't think is reasonable. Like being an antinatalist is like being pro-life. I just, I don't feel that way anymore. I don't feel like people ought to do anything. Um, even though I have personal morals and I do think there are like ways to organize society in a way that's ethically sound, I think being an antinatalist or being pro-life is counterintuitive to harm reduction. And I'm more focused on harm reduction, not in a philosophical sense, but in a practical sense. I just think you should harm reduce practically. And I think uh, pro-life, antinatalism, I think they harm, uh, they don't harm reduce. Yeah, I think they contribute more harm than good the world. So it doesn't make sense to utilize them as an, a, a label or a prescription. Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool